Good morning, everyone. Really good to see so many of you online with us again today. I'm Maxine Fakara, Practice Oral CEO. It's my pleasure to welcome you to the latest in our series of Shed Talks, where we talk candidly with influential individuals from the knowledge exchange ecosystem. And we're all really looking forward to hearing from Alice Hugh Wagner from the British Business Bank today. Um, before we get started, a few housekeeping points. We've got a large group on this call, so to keep the bandwidth under control, we'll see that we've turned off participant video and sound. Uh, of course, the whole point of this session is for you to ask questions of our guest speaker, and so we'll be using the chat function to log those. So you should see that function at the bottom of your screen. I'll be keeping track of all the questions alongside Sean, so just send questions in as you think of them. We don't need to wait to be asked and we'll do our best to queue you up appropriately. Uh, do please remember to note your, um, your full name and your organisation if you submit a question to the chat. Um, some people have rather random names on their personal Zoom accounts, so that's, uh, that's always a bit tricky. Um, so if you're having uh, difficulties with anything on the call, then you can also use that private chat function to contact the meeting host. Um, just to remind you too that we're videoing the session, so it will be made available after the event to practice all or members. Okay, so let's get started. It's my pleasure now to introduce Sean Fielding, Praxis Oral Chair and Director of Innovation, Impact and Business at the University of Exeter. So how's life in the Southwest this morning, Sean? Looking great, uh, Maxine. The, the rain has passed and it's uh, sunny out. Um, so welcome to the uh, Praxis Oral Shed Talk, uh, so-called because it involves a talk and at least some of it happens in a shed, uh, in my shed in South Devon. Uh, you might hear seagulls um, or rain or the school next door, but that's, uh, that's normal. So the idea with this series is to enable us to meet um, influential people in our world uh, at a time when we can't get out quite as much as we used to. And after week 15, um, to be honest, we're not really fit to be seen out. Um, my wife has threatened me with a man bun uh, at the moment, so uh, we'll see how that goes. And um, today we are going to be uh, talking with Alice uh, Hugh Wagner. And Alice is Managing Director for Strategy, Economics and Business Development at the British Business Bank. Um, many of you will know the BBB is a, a leading player in UK venture and equity finance, a really strong supporter of patient capital schemes, uh, the enterprise capital fund scheme to connect up with new fund managers and regional investment programs and angel co-fund schemes. Recently they've been really working really hard on the whole coronavirus interruption schemes, um, uh, the bounce back loan scheme, the future fund. In fact they've mostly been uh, just inventing exciting new names for um, for schemes over the last uh, few months, I think. Um, many of those schemes have been used by uh, spin-out and spin-in companies linked to UK universities. And, and the British Business Bank estimates that it's supported 11% of all equity deals in UK SMEs last year, which is a great uh, track record. Alice has had a career in banking, strategic marketing, a stint at McKinsey, with degrees from the University of Texas in Austin and MBA from INSEAD. Alice describes herself as a cross-cultural native, uh, which I think means she's happiest looking at things from the outside in. So I hope that you will all find her insights valuable on the very day, in fact only an hour after the government has announced its new R&D roadmap. So Alice, welcome to the shed. Uh, here we go. Thank you very much for having me, Sean. It's, um, it's an absolute pleasure to join you in your shed. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's uh, virtually. It's great, yeah, it's great to have you with us. And um, we're hoping it'll be uh, uh, the kind of thing that people all around the world want to be joining us in a shed. Um, I think it's probably the only thing to do. So let's, um, let's make a start, Alice, by um, uh, I wonder if you are able to give us your view on the um, the state of venture capital and equity capital markets at the moment. Um, on the face of it, you did a report last week on investment into SMEs and um, it seemed to give a really positive picture. What do you think the overall picture is, Alice? 
Well, the thing is, is that the data in the equity markets always lags, right? So, so that's always, you know, uh, important to realize that you're looking at the rear view mirror as you're trying to sort of navigate your way forward um, and, and quite how far back you're seeing. So the data that we shared last uh, week was mostly to the end of 2019, although we did have some sort of early uh, Q1 data as well. And what it showed was 2019 was a, was a peak year. It was really good, but it was already showing some signs of weakness, some softening. Um, particularly in the early stage uh, of venture capital, which is, of course, the area that um, your, uh, the audience that, that we have today is going to be particularly interested in. Um, I didn't want to call, we, we saw some softness in 2018 already, and I didn't want to call it because, you know, one or two data points does not a trend make. But, but we, are, we are seeing some signs of, of concern. More importantly, um, through, because we do sort of work with um, uh, investors uh, pretty, uh, pretty constantly. We know that it's been more difficult to raise money. It's still, it's still fairly positive. There's a lot of, um, there's a lot of uh, dry powder as it were. So spare money, you know, money that's already been raised that, you know, is looking to, to go into companies. But a lot of that is going to go into the existing portfolio companies, right? People who have already had their first stake. Um, there is some concerns about if you haven't already gotten in, you know, how much bandwidth, how much money is there for folks who, um, who are sort of raising their first round. So, uh, you know, and we'll have to see how that goes over time. Um, but at the moment, we're definitely keeping a weather eye on, on the entire sector. And, and of course, you guys will have known with the, with the Future Fund, that's explicitly out there to try and help sort of bridge sort of rounds where, you know, if there's a, just, just a problem of timing, like if you, know, if, you, if you were just trying to raise and it was a really difficult time, um, that the Future Fund was, was able to sort of have the government inject some additional firepower so that, you know, people would be able to, to, to get through sort of yeah. this, this, just this immediate coronavirus sort of crunch time where basically, you know, it's not true that all, by the way, it's not true that all sort of um, deals have, have stopped. I mean, a lot of deals we know did happen via Zoom, you know, have signed sort of remotely and we, we, we're, we're aware of that happening. But I think it is fair to say that those were transactions where they were pretty far down the road, you know, where there was a lot of social capital people had met before, you know, they're just trying to get to the end. Um, it's, a, it's where there's not a social capital, you're still trying to get to meet people. That's the part where what we're doing right now is, is a lot harder. I mean, like, Sean, you and I, you know, we were at a dinner together, weren't we, sort of with Praxis Oral, like literally right before um, sort of the whole thing locked down. And that makes sort of talking to you yeah. ever so much easier, even though, you know, you're, you know, you're hundreds of miles away from me. Yeah. It's, it would be different if I had never met you before, right? So... It might be an area that we come back to later on in thinking about the, um, you know, what comes next. Yeah, you know, how do we build up social capital uh, again? Um, I just want to make sure um, people on the call realise that there, we have put a copy of the um, SME uh, equity report um, on the website. So if you if you go to the link where the, um, the shed talk um, uh, area is, you can uh, pick up the report from there. And and it's really interesting. Um, you know, the, uh, as Alice says, the, um, the position obviously is, is reporting back, but um, investment in the UK tech business has increased by 27% um, uh, over the last year period. So, you know, in that sense, it's a very positive report, but we'll come on to some of the things it's, um, it's less strong on and, uh, and where we see the uh, things moving later on. Um, just thinking about that landscape overall, Alice, where, where do you think university ventures and funding partnerships with universities, where do they fit into that? So we, I mean, the R&D uh, landscape being published today is absolutely critical because we, we know that uh, that is actually the sort of foundation for a lot of the best sort of investments in the UK, particularly deep tech, anything that's science based, anything you know, that's an R&D based. Not, not all, not all, not all um, startups are, but there is actually a substantial portion that is. And so, and it's actually, um, if you look at the areas, the sectors where the UK is strongest, for example, life sciences, um, quantum, uh, those are both sectors that are deeply rooted in the university, you know, uh, ecosystem. I mean, I think, I think, I'm, I don't know if this um, number is correct, but I've heard it said that something like 50% of all life sciences sort of um, startups that get VC funding originate one way or the other out of the university sector. Yeah, I can't, I can't verify that number, but that's, it sounds plausible. And, um, and what that means is, is that 
um, in a lot of ways, the R&D that, that goes into the university system, into the, the research system, um, basically is the foundation for creating the seedlings that the private sector can then invest in sort of over time. So, so it's really critical. Yeah. Uh, and that, therefore, um, yeah, finding ways of supporting that um, area um, presumably also becomes critical. Uh, and we'll, co we'll come back to that uh, in a second, I think. So just, just come back to the COVID um, question. Um, it, you know, that we've seen effects on the markets, you know, overall um, going up and down um, over <laughs> this period. Um, what, what are you feeling in terms of the, the, so this, over this next year? Are you feeling bullish? Is the, is the community feeling bullish about the opportunities or are they going to um, retrench because the markets are going down? Is, what's the feeling? Well, I mean, let's let's put some okay. Let's put some context around this. Okay, venture capitalists uh, or investors in general in the early stage are inveterate optimists. Like you would never do this, get into this line of work if you weren't an optimist, right? I mean, this is an area where we know, like at least half of the investments are going to to like go. You get nothing back. Like you can lose all your money, but you can't tell ex ante, right? It's all ex post. So ex ante, like you would knowing that like ex post, you're going to lose half your money, right? But you don't know which half. You kind of have to be optimistic about it, right? And and that's the other thing. It's um we we find that the early stage companies have not been. So this is some Bohr's data that came out. Have not been impacted that much by Corona. I mean some. I mean there are some. I mean they're impacted by the things like, for example, um you know if you can't get into your uh, your business and you can't tinker with things, you can't go into the workshop, you can't go into the lab, that, that's a problem. But generally speaking, if you're early stage, you weren't having any revenues anyway to lose, right? So, I mean, because that's been the biggest sort of impact of Corona is that, you know, people just lost all their revenues overnight. Well, if you didn't have any revenue, <laughs> it's like, you know, um, the, the bigger problem is if you run out of runway, if you run out of investment, sort of money to sort of continue the work that you're doing to prove your proof of concept and all the rest of it. And so, um, so I think, uh, and then of course, the, what you should be doing uh, is economizing, just like all of us, right? I mean, the fastest way to make your runway go longer is to spend less and, you know, reduce your burn rate down to your absolute minimum, right? This is not the time to, to, be, to be wasteful, as it were. Um, but so therefore, I think we are reasonably positive, uh, just as long as we're able to ensure that that early stage work, that's why the R&D spend is incredibly important, you know, continues on because um, the data shows, and I'm all about the data, that um, uh, this is also in the, in the slides that we, we shared. Um, post the global financial crisis, th th those vintages were some of the best vintages for us in terms of investments that were made at the trough, you know, when, when it, it was the darkest time, right? And there was the least amount of money, least amount of competition. Um, if you were strong enough to get uh, investments at that point, some of those were the best investments over the long term that, that, that did the best, right? I mean, it's a big if. You know, the, the if, if you can survive through and, you know, persevere and, you know, convince people to give you money and, and you know, go on. Those tend to be really fantastic sort of outcomes, disproportionately. Yeah, yeah absolutely. Uh, and if you, if you think about um, getting ourselves out of the, um, the current crisis, um, it's really good to see that R&D pathway um, document that's been, uh, or roadmap that's been, uh, been developed. Uh, because otherwise it seemed like the government was really just hoping that the pubs would do it for us. Um, <laughs> yeah. um, but if you think of your, the place of British Business Bank in all of that, um, what do you see as the, as the key problems that British Business Bank is trying to solve um, for this community? So there are, there, there are definitely two philosophical sort of um, points of view on this. Um, and, you know, I have had conversations with uh, Marina Matsukato, for example, at, at UCL about this um uh th and there's basically there's there's two things there's there's treasury orthodoxy which says you know the british business bank is here to fix where the the markets don't work right and i think you can make a case that the early stage investing is an area it's a market it's a market failure and that it doesn't work and so we we have a legitimate role in terms of um ensuring that you know fixing those market gaps by injecting capital and coordination and all the rest of it there's another side though which is marina's marina's sort of view which is you know if there's no there there right the government's job is to create the markets to begin with 
right? Because this one says you kind of work with the, the players that are there and you try to make them stronger. But if it's if there's nothing there at all, you you know, there's no market that's broken. It just doesn't exist, right? So, you know, it, it doesn't exist for a reason. Marina's view is if it doesn't exist, make it exist, right? Which is a little bit riskier and philosophically coming from a slightly different place. So um, I'll give you an, ex I mean, the two in practice are actually kissing cousins. They're not, it's not either or, you know, as with any, many things in life, it's a spectrum, isn't it? And it's not, it's not a digital sort of trade-off. Um, so, so what, what we can do, what we've been doing is we've been trying to, where there are seedlings, um, there are people doing good things, we try to back them. So I can finally talk about um, Epidarex, which is a 102 million pound fund. Uh, it's an enterprise capital fund um, and it's headquartered in Edinburgh. Uh, it also has a foot out in um, the US in uh, Maryland. Um, and it basically focuses, I mean, it, it originates in a lot of different places, but about half of its origination does focus on universities and universities outside of the Golden Triangle, yeah, because they're headquartered in Edinburgh, so they tend to be sort of more, more northerly sort of um, focused, and that's their, you know, and they focus on life sciences specifically as well. And, um, and it is one of these things where, so we're 50 million pounds out of that 102 million pounds, and, uh, and we, we basically go in. Uh, and we will share on the downside, but we get paid out first at a pretty low return, about you know three percent or so. And basically, everybody else gets the upside. So what we're doing is we're, we're crowding in additional money into, and and most and quite a lot of that money will end up sort of you know into you know great companies that come out of sort of northern universities and life sciences, um, and that kind of helps that helps the ecosystem. Does that make sense, Sean? Yeah, yeah, and and it's really exciting news, um, and good to see you in that such a big proportion too. Uh, try and make that work. Um, I've heard you talk before about a kind of loop of death for um, for businesses that you're trying to solve. Can you talk us through that? Yes. So, so I mean, basically, what we see is that there's not enough money from the private sector that goes into a particularly early stage investments, right? And because there's not enough fund managers with not enough money, then they make sort of fewer numbers of investments and the amount that they can give to each company is, is less. Okay, so that means fewer companies get it and they, they have shorter runways um, and they end up spending either more time trying to raise the same amount of money or, you know, doing, doing less and being slower. And what happens when you do that is you've got fewer great because uh, this is a numbers game, right? You have fewer companies that are invested into. Um, and when you know that's one in 10 that's going to knock it out of the park, it, you know, it makes a difference if you have 10 investments or 30 investments or 10 investments versus 20 investments, right? Because it makes a difference. And then what happens is you get subscale returns for the sector as a whole. You know, the difference between having one you know, it's the difference between having one knock it out of the park versus two knock it out of the park. If you have two that knock it out of the park, one of them might be a unicorn. And because the returns look poor, because, you know, VC returns are always, it's a, it's a power scale, right? It's always determined by the, the one, I mean, it's less than 10% that sort of creates all of the value. Um, then the, the returns look poor and then therefore you don't get enough money and it's a doom loop. Because the returns are poor, you don't get enough money. Because you don't have enough money, you don't get enough sort of spread out and to, so that you can get the really good returns. Mm -hmm. And so what we're trying to do is that we assume through all of this that in order to make it sustainable, you know, you have to prove to the private market that you can make money, right? Fundamentally, that, that's what it comes down to. Because if you can make the money, you break the doom loop. Right. But you have to start at you know, chicken and egg. Right. You have to start it somewhere. So our job is to inject the money so that so that Epidarex's fund is not 50 million, but 100 million. Right. So they can do more. They can have you know, invest in more companies, follow them on for longer. So they're more likely to get the outsized returns that will allow them to raise the next fund and, and, and sort of break the break the doom loop. Does that. Yeah. And I think it comes back to that point about it being a numbers game. <clears throat> which I suspect we'll we'll come back to a bit later on, particularly in the context of regional um, activity. Um, so, thinking um, so, some of those um, funds will be thinking about um, uh, follow-on uh, type um, activity, and some will be thinking about seed and and earlier. Um, if we could focus a bit on the on the seed piece, because in in the report, and I, I just note that the. Um, uh, the report is now on the chat, so if anyone wants to get click on it from the chat uh, function, that's uh, very straightforward. Um, uh, but if you look at that, the seed fund is um, the seed 
uh, expenditure and um, volume, of, volume of deals is actually um, not decreasing, but the amount being spent uh, in, in seed area it seems to be going down. Um, and, but definitely the amount in later stage ventures is going up significantly. Um, whose job do you think it is to, um, to reignite that funding for the early stage um, uh, pipeline? Who's, who's, is it your job? Who, who's who's going to be doing it? Well, the thing is, is the early stage stuff is hard graft. And I don't need to tell that to the people who are on this call, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, um, there, there is, there's a natural tendency for a fund manager. Like if, if you can do, it takes the same amount of effort to do a bigger deal as it does to do a smaller deal, right? So all else being equal, you'll do the bigger deal, given that your time as a human being is, is constrained, right? So what happens is the people who do the smaller deals either are, have to, like they, they don't have the ability to do the bigger deals because their funds are smaller because they don't have the credibility, or they want to, Right, because there's the smaller deals, you know, um, feed their bigger deals, uh, so that that can you know that can make sense from it. Or they, from a purpose perspective, believe in it, right? Because sometimes it's actually more fun in some ways to do the smaller deals, mm -hmm. um, right? But but you still have an obligation to do the larger ones. I can't tell people not to follow on because if you don't follow them on, you're never going to be able to get the returns that you need to be able to go back and put money into the early stuff. So so there's I think it's um. I think it takes a village. How about that, right? Mm -hmm. Like the, we definitely have a role, but the community has a role too, right? In terms of we need to support, we need to support our young people and the people starting out. So this is where the ECF, the emerging fund managers, right? We need to give. There's always the young and hungry folks who want to do the small bit deals, and who have to because you know that's where they're starting out, so they have to. But somebody has to take a punt on them, right? And we can do some of that, but the private capital has to come along as well. Okay, so there is, and by the way, a lot of the talent for this comes out of your ecosystem, right? Um, you know, the PhDs who may not want to go into research, but might have a bit of an entrepreneurial streak and want to do that stuff, right? Yeah. So, so there's a talent sort of thing about backing talent, backing it with money, right? Um, and then, but there is also, there's an onus on us. We, 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 we confess to that. And there's also an onus on the private sector to sort of focus on that as well. So it, it won't work unless all of us work together, I think. Yeah. And there's, a, there's clearly a, a, you know, a financial capital gap of, of some kind and a talent gap as we, as we go. And, and I'll, I'll come back to the talent gap in, in a minute because there may be some things that you know, we can do together around that mm. to try and increase uh, the number of people who, who want to do this and can do it effectively. Um, just, about the, um, for, just to follow a bit on the seed funding piece, um, Universities have um, invested in translational activities of various kinds over, over time. Um, we've had various schemes to enable us to do that within our, <coughs> our own environment. And in fact, we, um, uh, we talked to UKRI in one of the early um, shared talks about their new catalyst scheme, um, which would be a way of, um, of, of bringing that uh, together. Um, one of the things that happened several years ago was the university um, uh, challenge funds, um, uh, where you know, money was allocated to universities who then um, uh, made a go of the of ventures. Do you see something like that? This is the one from the early 2000s, right? That's right. Yeah. Yes, yes. No, I do know those. Yeah. Yeah. Do you see something, the potential of something like that emerging? Um, in the uh, in the future, I would love to see it. I mean, we'd need to um, we need to update it. I mean, it has been twenty years, and you know we do. I mean, the the great thing about that is, um, you know, not all of them succeeded, but of the ones that did, they've formed the 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 crux where you know of you know for example, um, I think did Set Squared come out of that as well? Uh, not out of no, not out of that one specifically, did it? Yeah, no. Um, I mean, I know like I do know that there's a there, there have been been a couple of other uh, other funds that, that we work with that, that have uh, have their their history mm -hmm. as it were rooted in that. So I think I think that's right. I think it would be quite good. We'd have to. I mean, the 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 thing that I would say is that nearly all of those were subscale. I mean, I think it was like twenty million pounds, something yeah. ridiculous. I mean, it's just. I mean, I mean, even adjusted for inflation, it wasn't enough money, right? Um, and so and so the ones that succeeded were the ones that realized that very early on. 
and then and very aggressively try to raise additional money from their universities or from private capital or whatever in order to survive to get to a it, it's the doom it's a doom loop right so there's a critical massing where like if you don't have a, a critical size the maths just don't work um you know there's a minimum fund size that we know right like yeah. You know, people need to eat. Like, if you don't, if you don't have, if you, if you don't have a fund of a sufficient size so that the um, the management fee is enough to pay for high quality staff, like it just mathematically does not work. So, um, so you know, we do. That's that is one. Of, so I think there are things that we could do to that. But yeah, no, it was. It was I think the um, the root concept is a is a sound one. Yeah. I mean, what do you think? Um, well, I think there's a lot of um, interest in that, and. Um, also interest in the um, enterprise capital fund uh, as a kind of vehicle for encouraging that somehow. Um, mm -hmm. So I think um, uh, the idea of a, a university enterprise capital fund somehow that um, is targeted on those kinds of projects may be rather attractive. Um, but I, I don't think it should be just focused on um, spin outs. It it's mm -hmm. should, you know be part of that bigger ecosystem um, piece that. Um, Certainly in set squared, that the, you know, and in some of the um, CCF projects, which have that broader group, that group of businesses that come together, it just gives enough critical mass to make it work. I think. Yeah, no, I mean, I love what you guys have done in set squared. You know, about sort of being more open-minded. You know, that you don't have to keep yourself within your university ecosystem. You know, that in order to build that critical mass of high-quality deals, that you reach out. I mean, knowledge exchange is about reaching out, isn't it, into society? Um, and, and working with your local communities to sort of, you know, help um, help entrepreneurs, even if they're not directly sort of linked to the to the university, uh, because a good deal is a good deal, and you know, and you've got skills that that are otherwise very thin on the ground. And, and what do you think? The, you talked about the um, uh, the kind of human capital in this uh, being uh, there are not enough people that know how to do this effectively. Um, I think. And um, and that therefore concentrates the um, uh, the expertise and the deals into a smaller number of of, um, of organisations. Um, uh, and and Emma Thorne has asked the question about um, you know how is that a concern that there's a concentration of investment in fewer companies, bigger deals? What impact does that have on the pipeline um, uh, of you know because companies trying to raise investment they've got a smaller group of people to go to. Um, I think I think you've probably answered that question in terms of you know overall that 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 picture of not enough money in the in the system, but I wonder about the um, you know from an investor's point of view how does it feel um, to be um, presented with these kinds of deals that they might not understand um, that it feels like there's a kind of information asymmetry going on you know I, I'm not quite sure how to do this and yeah. No, absolutely. Particularly with anything to do with universities where there's science involved, right? Yeah. Yeah. Or, or even just sort of technical stuff involved, um, because this, this applies in the humanities as well, actually. Um, <laughs> yeah. Seriously, it does. Um, anything where you need to have technical mastery to basically understand whether to understand the underlying sort of business sort of proposition and the customer, you know, product customer fit is is uh, is more challenging from an information asymmetry. So. Um, so first of all, I, I guess like what I would say is that the BBB broadly, I mean, it's, it's baked into our objectives, right? We are explicitly tasked with in, um, supporting diversity. Okay, and I don't mean, I mean, diversity in terms of, you know, people who look different and all the rest of it, but also diversity in terms of choice, right? So that if you're starting up a company, you've got, you know, multiple people to talk to, not just one person to talk to, Right, and then you've got choices in terms of you could go with debt or equity or this or that. Like we're here, we're about because we came out of the global financial crisis, um, and we were founded by a, an economist. Actually, the whole idea of, of useful competition is is baked into us, and so we, all else being equal, we we definitely try not to, um, we try not to help mono natural monopolies or oligopolies continue. Does that make sense? Yeah. So so we totally agree that like we don't want to see concentration. We don't want to see too much concentration. Now, that being said, the, the fewer, bigger deals is a, is a maturity aspect, we think. Okay, it's okay to have the big deals as long as the little deals are also happening. Like, it's not either or, right? Like, we're trying to make it so it's not, it's not a zero-sum game. Like, 
we want to see those bigger deals happening because we know that unless we can concentrate fire and allow the bigger deals to happen, we'll never have enough unicorns, enough throw off enough sort of return off to be able to keep money coming in. But I do worry about at the same time, we still have to be watering our seedlings sort of over here, right? So, you know, we've got saplings that we're trying to get all the way up. Yeah, so we can harvest them at some point, but the seedlings that here, we can't like not weed the garden here just because we're too busy over here, right? So, so it's um it's a bit difficult because you know it's two different things, but but we do we do care about that. Um, and so like angels and universities and um, endowments and you know early stage venture capital funds, they all have a role to make sure that the seedlings still still happen. Does that make sense? Yeah, and uh, I was just about to come on to uh, as the school behind me has come out of. Uh, it, yeah, it's uh, really it's nice, actually. Um, uh, want to come on to the question of angels, um, particularly SEIS um, uh, investors. Um, generally, we have you know quite a lot of those you know, helping us with the saplings, the the really early things, um, and. Um, you know, there's a government wants to see more of this happening, and um, you know, it has put in um, incentives around the SEIS type scheme, um, but quite often it's hard to combine them. So, you know, if you took your, you know, your future fund um, programs, you know, you couldn't really connect those together no. um, and match those. Um, how how do you do you see a the potential for new programs developed that does provide even more help to those angels or to or to encourage more to come in? Um, yeah, so so the first thing is, just so, because it's worth my job, like hmm. BBB does not do tax programs, okay? Yeah. <laughs> at all. Like not my, not my bag and I'm not supposed to talk about them at all, right? But I would say SEIS, SEIS, uh, EIS, SEIS, are, are core to the um, to the ecosystem. We know from my last sort of angel report that something like 80, 85 percent of angel transactions involve the tax break in, in, in one shape or the other in the UK. Um, and so, so they're absolutely important. Um, to, we know we we acknowledge that they're part of the of the system. But that, in addition to that, yes, of course. You now we have we have two co-fund sort of um, programs. So uh, one is the regional angel program, um, where you know we will. Uh, for existing, these have to be pretty well established angel networks. We do due diligence on the, the overall approach. It's almost like an angel fund, as it were. Uh, and then basically once we agree a particular investment strategy, we basically put in say five to 10 million pounds. You go every deal that looks like that, we'll put in 40, 50% of the deal. Now, one of the things that would be really lovely to see, but I know that this is hard in a university sort of context, is to see, I mean, universities, some of them have some pretty cool alumni, right? You could do an, uh, sorry, originally American, you can tell from the accent, like, you know, for me, universities are like massive um, affiliations, right? I mean, people are very loyal to their universities in the States. And, um, and so you could do, you know, a university-based or a group of university-based sort of, you know, angel network that could invest in the underlying um, opportunities. Uh, and then, you know, once you have that up and going, you know, our, co our program could come in and sort of come, come alongside to provide extra firepower. We, I mean, it's, it's commercial, so you need to prove that you can sort of make money. This is, you know, this is not philanthropy, actually. But yeah, and then the other thing we have is something called the Angel Co-Fund, uh, which is a transaction by transaction basis, and it just requires three um, angels, one of whom is a, a, a lead angel, and they take the, the, the transaction to the angel co-fund and if, if if it passes due diligence then the angel co-fund which is you know all they get all their money from ourselves um, will be able to sort of match in that particular uh, um, transaction I think the average deal size there's about a about a million pounds or so so you know it goes from goes from pretty low to pretty high but it's you know it's it's probably um, you know it's they're open for business both of these are open for business and um, and so you know we, we definitely see that there's there's an opportunity there. The, the whole thing about the future fund not, not being compatible with EIS, SEIS, I don't want to get on into on this call, but it has a lot to do with state aid, mm -hmm. Brussels, uh, tax schemes, and, and all the rest of it. It, it. it comes down to EIS, SEIS are for equity, and actually the future fund is actually a debt mm -hmm. program, right? It's a convertible loan note, actually. And so, so the <clears throat> definitional thing, equity can't qualify for for a, a loan note. Yeah, uh, it's just, you know, always with these 
um, schemes, you, you, you have an outcome that you want and sometimes you can't achieve it in that way, um, but we need to keep finding ways of achieving it in other ways. Um, the, another strand of that is, um, is that whole proof of concept, the pre-seed um, area. And, um, and that's a big concern, I think, of quite a lot of our um, uh, community that are really um, try, just trying hard to get um, the, even the money to get a um, you know, initial support from a, um, from a potential chief exec, say, of a, of a venture or, a, or even a potential investor, you know. Um, uh, and you get that real challenge of, um, uh, well, I'll, I'll, I'll do some work for you, but I can't do that work without being paid. Uh, well, maybe I'll take sweat equity, but then I'll take quite a lot of sweat equity. And, mm. you know, you get all that. And actually, maybe it wasn't such a good idea in the first place. So that, that precede proof of concept scheme, which somehow connects with people and technology, seems to us to be quite important but it always seems to drop off the off the radar um yeah i know, know. You've got thoughts about that yeah no we've been investigating it for quite some time the scots actually have a really cool program that does this it's been running for about mm, i think three or four years at this point and it's exactly that they will put in money uh more importantly they also like will pay for the headhunters to um, find the rights for commercial talent to take uh to take a spin out idea um, I think I think this program applies to all of the Scottish um, universities, or any of the Scottish universities can apply for the program. Rather, uh, it's the other way around, um, and and essentially the the program will will help find will pay for finding the right talent. In fact, as I understand it, they they went as far afield as California. They got a you know for some of the some of the stuff that's in Scotland. Um, to find the right person, and then they'll pay for that person as a consultant for sort of three, well, it's not, it's not the set amount of time, it's to the next milestone, right, until the proof of concept to proof of commercial concept. And then they'll, you know, they'll, they'll do, they'll pay for that bit of work. And then at the milestone, that milestone will then either raise additional money or it won't. Um, and if it, if, if it is raising additional money, then that individual might step in as a CEO at that stage or something or a COO. Um, but if they, if it doesn't, if the idea goes, just fizzles because you know half of them do more than half of them do that's fine the person's been paid and might actually get recycled into another project somewhere else in the system i believe um the nti so uh newcastle university you know they there's three universities up there that also had tried a version of this through the ccf program um and that it's been pretty effective as well i mean this is part of the whole sharing best practice thing with ccf right we uh i, I tend to think that that approach is actually quite a good one um, because when we look at sort of um, translational or commercialization of of, tra of of translational science, you know, it's a, it's a triangle, right? You have finance, you have science or sort of intellectual capital, but you also have the commercial capability. And to to release the the constraints, you have to do all three at the same time. You, you know, because if you just if you release one bottleneck, all you do is you create make the next thing the bottleneck. You have to you have to do it concurrently, right? You have to add the money and the commercial talent and the sort of, you know, academic, you know, um, scientific talent all at the same time in order for the, for the spin out to work. And so, so we, um, we were just observing that, that, that is interesting. I just, there's not a national rollout of that, Sean. Yeah. Um, and so, so yeah, yeah, so it's, um, it's, it's difficult because it's uh, the, the, the maths on it aren't fully commercial is a thing. Hmm. Yeah, and I think there's a whole element of that which will probably never be commercial. Um, no, so maybe... <laughs> but it has a lot of spillovers. I mean, it's it's yeah. good, right? And I mean, I don't know. I mean, I, I tend to think, so you know that Angel Co-Fund thing I was talking to you about? Hmm. So originally, when we when we started that out, sort of, I think, God, seven, eight years ago now, uh, government was like, yeah, there's no way. You're going to lose money hand over fist, right? The whole thing was was a, a grant-based thing, right? Hmm. Like, like they, they, they'd written the whole thing off. Yeah. Okay, about four or five years in, we're like, wow, not only are we not losing money, we're making money, right? Mm -hmm. And so then we converted the whole thing into a loan and, and we're making, you know, it's, I think, <clears throat> yeah, I don't know. I mean, I think, I think there is something to be said for scale economies and I'm not saying it's going to make money. I'm just saying, I don't, I don't know that it's inevitable that it would lose money. I, I would say that nobody's made money yet and but nobody's done it at scale yet either i mean the the scottish universities um you know are, are i mean they're, they're they're wonderful but it's not a very large number of transactions we're talking about right 
Yeah, absolutely. <clears throat> and it probably could be done at scale, um, sort of locally managed, but done at scale nationally somehow. Um, and I, I think uh, I think you find universities quite ambitious for that. Can I just go back to the Enterprise Capital Fund question because Simon uh, Bond asked a question about mm -hmm. um, uh, about run rate, um, and uh, I think it's around about two a year, two or three a year, something like that. Um, you, you would would you want to see? a faster run rate uh, or a higher run rate um, for those? Um, we would love to, but I mean, I'll be totally honest. We're not capital constrained on that one. Yeah. So we've got a, a patient capital review um, reiterated that we've got a hundred million pounds. And, and I'll be honest, I mean, I know, cause I mean, just within the, if we had more, we would do them. I mean, it is not a problem. It's great for a, like, we don't have a budget where we're trying to go, no, we can only do two. It's quite the opposite. It's always do as many commitments as you possibly can, right? And, and it's, it's absolutely fine. Like there's no constraint on us to do just two a year. The, the problem is, is that um, it's the private sector match. Yeah. So like Epidaurex, for example, <clears throat> I have been dying to talk about Epidaurex for like literally 18 months, right? And it's just taken them a lot. The thing is I couldn't because there's a law because they were raising out of the States as well. And then in the US, there's a law that says while you're raising, you can't talk about you know, before you've done your final close, you can't talk about your, your first close, right? You can't announce first close, but okay. Uh, and nearly everybody has to raise money from the States. Let's just, just put that out there, right? Yeah. Um, and it's taken them a bit. I don't think they would mind me saying this. I think it's taken everybody a little bit longer to raise than, than, than mm -hmm. they planned. Um, and that's what holds us up, right? Is that, uh, I mean, getting money from us isn't that hard, but we don't want to put our money out there until we're convinced that you have a fighting chance of, you know, you're, you're meant to get the money within six months, right? The, the rest of the matching. Now, of course, you know, if it takes you longer than six months, you know, typically, you know, we're, we're, we're pretty pragmatic about this, but we don't want to be caught in a position where we have lots of things open. Does that, does that make sense? Yeah. So, um, so yeah, no, we, we, we are not, we are not capital constrained. We are actually, we are opportunity constrained. Yeah, so that's a great challenge um, to put to us, isn't it? Um, uh, and that brings me to regional yeah. questions. So Epidarex based in Edinburgh, mm -hmm. um, deliberately facing not the golden triangle. Um, we've got the CCF projects. Um, uh, how, Firstly, how do those CCF projects look from your point of view um, and things like set squared, I suppose, and um, how, how do you go about building regional momentum or momentum in the regions for uh, for investment? Because, you know, as you say, you're we're still having to raise a lot of money from just, you know, not even in this country. Um, yeah, yeah, no, definitely. Way. So, so um, yeah, no, I mean, I've, it's a, uh, I mean, I think, is it, Sean, did we meet that way? No, I think I met you through Praxis Oral, didn't I? I think so. Yeah. yeah okay. So um, I, I'm, I'm a big supporter of the CCF. In fact, I'm a big supporter of CCF Mark II, right? Because the first thing I said on this, and I, I was one of the judges, or I wasn't a judge. I, um, I was a, a subject matter expert, you know, that fed into the decision making on, on the, the CCF for those who had a finance sort of angle to it. So, you know, definitely was in the weeds reading, reading all the proposals and, and everything. And I've been, in, and Alice Frost has been lovely enough to keep me involved sort of ever since. Um, big, big supporter of it. But I would say two things. First of all, the CCF thing only being three years. I know why it's three years, but it's like, dude, three years? You gotta be joking me. I mean, like three years is just enough to get started. Like <laughs> you need to be able to have more than three years. So that's why I think CCF Mark II is is absolutely essential but two i'm really pleased about it because um there's this whole concept of critical mass particularly out in the regions and this is why we did the the regional angel program it's the same same conceptual base which is you need to have uh enough deal flow of high quality deals okay in order to be able to support the people and to support a fund and the fee structure okay and the truth is is that any individual university does not generate enough okay I mean, mm -hmm. even even Cambridge, Oxford, UCL, you know, it's it's touch and go, mm -hmm. right? Um, I mean, just about, but yeah, uh, it's not it's not like it's it's you know way over or anything like that. Um, and so, therefore, the only, particularly outside the Golden Triangle, what you need to do is you need groups. And CCF is basically a way of getting the coalitions of the willing, right? Because I know that universities, and I think government has a lot to answer for here. 
you know, you guys are not necessarily encouraged to collaborate all the time, but rather compete. And I mean, I have my own views about that, but I can tell you for sure as an investor that in this case, you know, it, there has to be like a single, well, an easy door to get in. Consistency would be nice. Um, but then, you know, enough stuff that's happening frequently enough that it, it's worth someone's while to sort of maintain that relationship. Yeah. Right. And so what CCF does is it provide, I mean, um, the, the finance, like my lot, we can't pay for that underlying infrastructure, right? The people, the, the, the combined TTO, right? To, to maintain the front door, right? Yeah. We, can, we can make sure that there are people that can come in. And by the way, it should be more than one, obviously. Mm -hmm. Like, you know, please don't do anything sort of, um, like, I, I, think, I think it's gone out of style, thank goodness. But the whole, whole concept of, um, exclusive deals is not a great one like you know cross-reference the whole like having a lot of choice is better than not having a lot of choice um by the way just as a complete aside um there's a good reason for that right because every single vc has their own take on things and they tend to be like no one particular subsector so i mean life sciences is like vast right i mean no you need to know about immunotherapy specifically and within immunotherapy a particular i mean like yeah and so mm -hmm. It is not good if you have one, just one person, to, one entity to talk to. It's much better if you have a whole range of different people knowing different things, different views to, yeah. for, for your, for your spin outs to, to be able to face off to. Yeah. So does that make sense? Yeah, I think, and I think we're, um, you, you know, I think we, we are pretty used to that now with schemes that, you know, can open, operate locally, can, can operate nationally with players coming in from different areas for different things. I think that's um, I think that's natural, but I am pleased to see you you think uh, you know having clusters of been clusters of organisations coming together, whether it's regionally or sectoral, presumably, and, and yeah. uh, actually uh, would be strong. Yeah, no, it's, I think it's essential. I mean, I think if we don't do it that way, it just doesn't work, right? It's the the, the cost of doing business, the transaction costs are too high. And yeah. quite frankly, with coronavirus these days, it's it, that's just put additional costs on, right? I mean, we know that in a recession, what tends to happen is everyone, it's sort of like, it's like frostbite, right? All the blood comes to the center again, to the things that are considered lower risk, and the extremities get sort of starved, right? That That is the, it's unfortunate that that is actually the natural tendency in a recession. Yeah. And the only way you can sort of overcome that is by working together and clustering it so there's enough of a hub that you know that the the finance and the, the talent still goes back and forth forwards to the hub yeah um so it's really great to hear you um say that alice i think it'd be very encouraging for for our community who are thinking about how to how to grow this at this at this particular time um we're, we're coming um we're in the last 10 minutes or so so um uh, some questions now about um <clears throat> what 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 we can do i suppose um and um one of the things which is a continuous challenge for us is that there's this perception that um uk universities are not as good at us universities at delivering valuable exits in, in fact the opposite is true and certainly in terms of the you know the top uh, the top universities delivering better exits for investors than, or, or more valuable exits uh, for investors than in the, in the US. H how do we deal with that question, which is um, yeah, being a hub ourselves as a country for investment coming in from, um, uh, from all around the world, in you know, global Britain, uh, attracting investment from all around the world. Um, how do we go about um, telling people about the strength of our of our community and our economy in this space? Well, I do think, okay, so this is where, I mean, I do, well, before, actually the last trip I did before lockdown was to New York um, with the with DIT and the British Venture Capital Association, basically to, um, in fact, with IQ Capital, because I just saw a, a question about this, you know, to try and um, get the word out about uh, UK funds and UK opportunities, right? And, um, I mean, and quite frankly, with coronavirus, the fact that, you know, Oxford has a vaccine going, you know, the fact that, you know, some of the research has shown that, you know, a very inexpensive steroid, you know, can actually help recovery rates. I mean, at least within the English speaking world, you know, the UK is still punching above its weight. Yeah. 
And so there's still a perception that, you know, there's some really good opportunities here. Um, I think we do need to work together though, because I, you know, like even DIT, like there, there is an entire, there is an entire sort of um, infrastructure to try and get the get the word out, but it isn't all joined up. So, so I, what I would say is, you know, I mean, like I've been talking to the NCUB about this as well, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, it would be good if we all, the UK is not big enough that we can all do it alone, actually. Like, I think uh, if we want to get the message that Britain's a great place to invest, I think we should probably work together. Uh, it's a bit more frustrating, um, yeah. you know, and compromise but it's probably not such a not such a such a bad idea um i mean i know like i work with the greater london sort of promotional agency and they as a matter of principle will not slag off any other part of the uk because they're like you know no we're we're, we're pro london but we're not anti anybody else right yeah. and the whole idea is that if they bring the truth is uh if you get somebody into london and you get them to stay for five years then they'll start moving out yeah, which is not to say they can't go straight into Manchester. I mean, that's absolutely fine. It's just saying the reality is, is that often you go into London because London equals UK and then and then you get comfortable and then you, you sort of move out. Mm. So, you know, it's things like that. It's like, you know, do people sort of view it as a competitive thing or, you know, a, a collaborative or, or something in between? You can you can compete and collaborate. Mm. Yeah, I mean, well, take, a, take a look at Cambridge. I mean, yeah, you know. <laughs> yeah, the most competitive place on earth. Um, what, what do you think about um, uh, you know, ways of, of promoting um, our strength? So, for example, there was a um, report that came out last year, the Octopus Report, of which um, did the league table of um, you know, exits um, in universities. How helpful are those kinds of things to investors outside of the UK? That was an FT thing, so it went. Yeah, through. I don't know. I mean, like the thing is, is that, um, like I said, it's that power rule, right? So, mm -hmm. I mean, I'm just saying, thinking that, like, one of our best exits was Blue Prism, which came out of Liverpool. Yeah. yeah. I mean, it's, it's it's been grand, but you know, but equally, I wouldn't expect like. It's not lightning can't strike twice. I'm just saying that, like, it's a bit random, yeah. right? And so, you know, somebody will look good this year and then they won't look good for the next few years because, yeah. you know, unicorns come come infrequently. It's, it's just the nature of the, of the business. They will come more frequently if you have more more volume. But yeah. like, do you see what I mean? Like, I, and also I know academics move around. Right. Well, yeah. And, I mean, and also it takes a long time in many cases to get these ventures going, you know. Yeah. Like 10, 15 years. Yeah. And so, you know, it, I'm not sure it's that. It's a it's a marketing thing, and it's maybe it's useful mm. as far as that goes. Um, mm. But I would rather sort of be able to promote that like there's a great ecosystem in you know AI, or there's a great ecosystem in advanced manufacturing, sort of in the Midlands. Um, you know, I mean, do you know what I mean? It's sort of yeah. something that's a little bit more permanent. Yeah. So just come in the last few minutes, just to um, the sort of human capital pieces, um, and. Um, uh, and actually, thanks to Lizzie Whittington, who's put details of the Northern Accelerator in the chat so people can see that. Um, just on this, um, uh, well, I think there's two things. One is, um, what do you, you, you touched on it at the beginning about social capital and, um, uh, and how we're using up our social capital at the moment. And, you know, does the, does the venture capital equity industry rely on pressing real flesh? Or can they can they operate in a in a in a more socially distanced world? I don't know. I mean, I think we're all we're all animals at the end of the day, hmm. you know. And I, I I I'm a bit of a fuddy duddy about this one. Um, <laughs> you know, I'm 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 too old to to think that you. I don't know. I mean, like this this is me. Like this is no longer the, the sort of the official hmm. thing. Hmm. Um, what I know is is that the best venture capitalists. They don't bet necessarily on the underlying business case. They bet on the people, yeah. Because no matter what you do, you're going to have a couple of near-death experiences and pivots. Like this is just statistically inevitable. So it's about the, the the human beings involved, how well they get along with each other, and whether or not they're able to roll with the punches and sort of pivot multiple times to to do what it takes to to survive and and thrive, right? Yeah. Can you can you make that assessment through Zoom when you've never met them? I mean, I guess if you had to, you could, but, yeah. but historically, I mean, it, it will be 10, 15 years before we know if those decisions were okay or not. Yeah. 
we'd, we'd all have a much better idea of the of, of our bedrooms wouldn't we um, <laughs> well given that I'm, I'm i'm talking to you from sort of one of my kids bedrooms uh yeah um so i do think that you can build what you can do is though that you can build on social capital uh where you have actually met so even within the constraints of the pandemic i think there is stuff that you can do to you know like you know like we're talking yeah right? well and also people who know people it's you know the social capital doesn't have to be just with you does it you know you can recommend me to somebody i can talk to them um let's um uh we, we touched earlier on about the that human capital gap in both um uh venturing the venturing community and I think probably also in the um, in the knowledge exchange community too. Um, and I think um, you know when we look back, the whole the creation of Praxis was all about um, human capital. You know, we wanted to make sure we had the right people. And I think there'd be quite a lot of interest in the community in um, in perhaps working with you and others in some kind of um, something aimed at building that skills base. Yeah, I mean, but, for example, we could talk about, you know, what are the usual things that VCs care about and look at? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, that that sh everyone should kind of vaguely know that and then yeah. and, and in the concrete terms, right? Yeah. I think that's the kind of thing we could we could collaborate on and, and, so and I do. Think I'll, yeah, I'll come back to you on that. I think that's a really good plan. Uh, can I just have one final question then, um, which is um, what advice would you give to you know, founders of high tech companies, deep tech companies starting now? Um, yeah, are they better off just putting everything off because it's all a bit difficult? Should they press ahead? What's your what's your thinking? I think they should press ahead, but in a cautious manner. I mean, in a in a reasonable manner. Um, so, you know, you do need to make sure that uh, you're that you have some runway, um, which is a, a, a factor of privilege, quite frankly. Um, monitor that so that you know you're doing minimum minimum viable product means minimum. Yeah, um, but actually, risk is a relative thing. I mean, it's not exactly not risky to take a a job in um, in the corporate land right now, either, right? And you know, if you are finding yourself at a loose end, you know, this isn't a bad thing to sort of invest your time and efforts into, quite frankly. So you know, I, I definitely group together, but I mean, the whole concept of moonlighting, for example, is mm -hmm. also still still a good one. Yeah. Um, and and particularly for a lot of the people we're talking to sort of you know in who are have links to you know the r d i mean it's not like r d is exactly you know un you know free and easy either right now is it <laughs> no yeah so. so as you said this is the kind of period where um the choices you make uh can lead to big successes we could look back on this and think of it as the, the start of the golden age yeah i mean even if you fail you learn and you have something that you can say, this is what I was working on. It sure beats saying I was just on furlough, you know, playing on my <laughs> Xbox for, yeah. you know, a year. Yeah. Right? So. Brilliant. Well, that's a great call to arms, um, Alice, and a great point for us to end uh, today. So thank you very much on behalf of all of us. for. Yeah, thank you so much for having me, Sean. Shed. It was great to have you. And, um, and I'll pass back to Maxine. Thank you very much, Alice. Can I add my thanks? Absolutely um, great discussion this morning. I think we could have gone on uh, for a lot longer and hopefully we'll continue these conversations and pick up on some of the things that we've discussed. So um, again, thank you very much, Alice. Great discussion.